following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. I am back. Giant space ball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I have a very, very special guest today to talk New York Giant baseball, specifically the 1951 Giants the Bobby Thompson shot heard around the world Giants and the uh, first baseball game games I ever saw were in 1951 Uh, the first one in particular was at the Polar Grounds and no better person to talk to about this uh, is a returning Becoming a regular on these airwaves, I'm proud of that. He's one of the most interesting people on the planet. Planet, how about that? Um, And I'm not, uh, I'm not blowing smoke. Mr. Noel Hind, welcome back, sir. Hi, Ralph. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. I always a pleasure. Yeah, um, you fit right into this show because. you wrote a book on the Polar Grounds, and um, um, we've talked about it on the air before. Why don't you give me an idea of uh, what your response is when I mention the 51 Giants in particular? Well, I have to think, uh, perhaps I'm biased because I grew up thinking of myself as a New York kid. I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in Connecticut but that uh, a, a bit also, but that was uh, obviously within the media area of the uh, three New York teams, which existed at the time. And uh, it's my feeling that even after 100 and close to 150 years of professional baseball in the United States, the greatest single moment was the Bobby Thompson home run in 1951. And that is obviously my initial point of reference. When you mention the 51 Giants, you can always hear that almost overdone recording of Russ Hodges screaming the Giants win the pennant. But really, uh, with all the drama that baseball has given us and all the great players and everything, I still think that is the moment, and to some degree, that is the team. They are picking Bobby Thompson up and carrying him off the field. Um, probably for, that, probably for his, his own safety when you think about it. But, yes, absolutely. Right. Um, I still get goosebumps when I hear that. Yeah. New York's baseball was such a incestuous operation at the time. I mean, there were only 16 major league teams. Three of them were in New York. Um, Two others were uh, in Philadelphia, not even that far away. So Dodger and Giants fans could actually, if they cared to, go down and and watch games at uh, Connie Mack Stadium, which was beginning its long descent into uh, decrepitude at the time, but that's another story. Uh, But you, you know, here you go. The uh, from I guess forty seven to sixty three, almost every World Series had at least one New York team. Fifty nine was the exception. Chicago, but they, and, but uh, fifty nine had a former New York team yeah. in the Dodgers, mm-hmm. and uh, technically. Uh, Technically, it was an exception, but it was an exception that proved the rule. How about that? Yeah, exactly. And and many of the uh, there were still many former Dodgers on that uh, from Brooklyn on that '59 team. So including like, Snyder and um, mm-hmm. uh, Sandy Koufax, naturally, um, it, it was uh, it was as close to being a New York team at that point. We had just had our hearts literally broken as kids. And it was explained to me years later um, as a a middle-aged person by um, a friend of mine who happened to be a psychologist when I sat down and told her my loss as a kid. She was about the first person of of knowledge uh, of the the human psyche 
to realize that a kid takes a horrible blow when his or her team leaves, and I'm talking about kids of all ages. I was 11, but I don't think it would have been any different if I were 37, and suddenly you, the team you love is no longer there. Um, uh, it really sucked. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> I um, agree with you, and I'm sorry, I don't, didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just... It, uh, Ranting, you know. When I was, um, when I was, as you know, just to backtrack a little for those who are listening, um, I wrote the Giants of the Polo Grounds originally in the mid '80s. It was published by Doubleday and Company in 1988, and then this last year, I updated it with new pictures and uh, 250 new pages to go on top of the 350 that um, were in the original edition. But when I updated, this gets back to what we were just talking about, I sent a few emails around to people who might might have remembered the Giants, you know, people my age, people who were in my uh, uh, high school or secondary school class. And it was phenomenal. What I was looking for were reminiscences of people who actually remembered the team in New York and even remembered going to the polo grounds, even if it was just to see a Mets game. And it was phenomenal how many people, um, you know, who were eight years old at the time were telling me, oh, I cried that day that, you know, they're really leaving. My team is really leaving. And it Mm -hmm. really put a mark on a big part of a generation of young men and women who were kids at the time um, who lost their team. Uh, the, the same goes, obviously, for the Brooklyn fans. Um, it's uh, ironic that in retrospect and in looking back, the Giant fans and the Dodger fans, who would have been at each other's throats in 56 and 57, had the same experience. And, and there's almost a bonding or a kinship uh, between them over the years. You lost my team that way. You lost your team that way. I lost my team that way. And I think it was the Mets, that, whom you mentioned a, a while back in the conversation, who really uh, brought the Giants and Dodger fans together because, let's face it, they were a compilation of uh, filling the needs of of both National League fans. And um, uh, ironically, there must be seven people on my network here who are former Dodger fanatics. I mean, historians, mavens, uh-huh. buffs. You're a, you and Hal Bach on this station are the and myself are the only Giant fans, true Giant fans. Marty Rose liked the Giants a little bit when he he grew up, uh, growing up, but he wasn't a fanatical Giant fan um, like the three of us were. And I find, in general, there are many, many more Dodger fanatics, Brooklyn Dodger fanatics, than people who identify themselves as New York Giant fanatics um, uh, on Baseball Fever, one of the big um, big baseball um, blogs in on the internet, for instance, many many more Dodger fans on that. So um, it's a pleasure for me to talk to somebody who really cared, not just knew some numbers, this that and the other thing, but had their emotions invested in it. And that's what baseball is. It's not. Uh, um, it's not anything more than that. It's um, uh, what we choose to uh, be uh, the microcosm of life. Or, is baseball, or, or some say, as I've said this before, that life is a microcosm of baseball. Um, yeah. so, so any any way you want to look at it. Um, and you mentioned you're looking for the people to talk to that uh, remember those days. I was five years old, and my grandfather, um, I had the pleasure of uh, 
being foisted on my grandparents by my parents um, in my early years so that um, they could not have kids, <laughs> if, if you would, uh, and still have kids. Um, and they lived in the Bronx, and um, uh, ergo a show on, on this network, Bronx Roots. And uh, I'd go up there, and every Saturday morning, when I, I, I remember in 51, the first year, my grandfather took his, um, started taking me to games, um, it was just a ritual. Saturday morning was Ladies' Day. Saturdays were Ladies' Day. The um, special event, I think ladies were half price or, or whatever it was. So oftentimes my grandmother would, would go along. But my grandfather would sit and talk to me about baseball. And um, I went to see the Giants be, um before Willie was called up and after Willie was called up. And we talked about the different the reconfiguration of the team, my grandfather and I. And um, over, the, over the next three or four or five years, opening day was always our, our big thing. And we could never tear our eyes off of Willie. You'd be in. You'd be watching a ball game, and the other numbers would flash by. You'd have Whitey Lockman. Uh, we'd sit in right field, so we had Mueller sitting right in front of us, standing right in front of us. Whitey Lockman off to the left, if you will, playing first. And but it would always go because of the the incredible amount of acreage in the polar grounds. Mm -hmm. You'd be drawn to the middle of that acreage, and there would be Willie. And mm -hmm. wherever the ball was hit to the outfield, unless it was hit directly at Monty Irvin or or Mueller, Mays would be there. Mm -hmm. You'd look up, and there would be Mays. And oftentimes it took him a while to get there because he was covering the biggest outfield with the slowest corner outfielders. Bless his heart, <laughs> Monty Irvin was in his 30s, and Mueller was just simply um, um, immobile. Um, and Willie covered all that ground, and um, his hat would go flying off. And the smile on his face and the glow and the smile on my grandfather's face in response to that as a kid. That was, and I know he reacted the same way to the smile on my face. It was a bonding that, um, that it wasn't just me bonding. It was baseball in those days bonded families generation to generation, this, that, and the other thing. He'd tell me about Wee Willie Killer, Keeler, um, hit him where they ain't. He'd say, take two and hit to right field. Get the guy over. Get him over. Get him in. Um, all these expressions that have stuck with me, um, the, the passion um, that he passed on, Philness, thank you, Grandpa. Rest in peace. I love you. So, there you go. Uh, that's my 51 <laughs> Giants. Well, the, one, of the, one of the many interesting things about that team, and again about Mays, have you ever in your life, I'm asking, it's not a rhetorical question, it's a question for you, Ralph, have you ever heard anyone say, I never liked Willie Mays, or I rooted against Willie Mays? Willie Mays was one of those players, everybody loved him. Everybody. Well, I guess you know. I guess some of the Dodger fans, uh, you know, when the things got really uh, tight between the team, but it is very unusual to hear anybody say anything bad about Willie Mays, uh, particularly as a player and in that era. Even the Yankee fans, uh, you know, wish they could have put him in left field. I guess next to Mantle. God, I. I, I I hate to well, I think they wish they could like put Mantle in left field next to Mays. I think, yeah, I think if, as, as if you're as, really realistic about it, um, Mays was the best of the three, and I, 
uh, I, my avid Dodger fans agree. Peter Trunk won. Willie is the best he ever saw. This, that, and the other thing. Um, but I will say this: it's uh, of the three, they all probably thought that DiMaggio was the best. I know okay. Willie did. Willie DiMaggio was Willie's hero as a kid. Um, mm-hmm. Whether he was or not, it's almost given the war, given the, his limited time, given his heel injury. Um, it's a very tough call, but um, I only saw DiMaggio play in one game in that 51 season. My grandfather took me to all three parks. He took me to Yankee Stadium, naturally, and he pointed to DiMaggio. He said, you're seeing him. Remember that you're watching this, that you saw him play. And um, I remember it. He took me to Ebbets Field, and he, across Bedford Avenue, he said, there's your Aunt Sonny's apartment, his sister, my great aunt. And Sonny lived on Bedford Avenue, and that was the window she looked out of. And I, and I was just so, I felt so close um, to, um, to being a Dodger fan, <laughs> if you know, know what I mean. I came so close that day. But then we went back to, to the Polar Grounds, and Willie had been called up, and um, there was just no doubt that the joy the the Giants brought us, and seeing that black and orange cap, mm-hmm. um, it, it was just it was just wonderful. I'll tell you a quick story, and I'll let you talk. It's Halloween on after the season is over in '51, and my grandparents and I are walking down on Fordham Road in the Bronx. And there's a store back then called Alexander's. Big-ass department store. (laughs) I mean, everybody shops at Alexander's. And we go into Alexander's. I'm five and a half now. I'm a big boy. And um, um, we're hit with the black and orange crepe. I knew the season was over. There was no more baseball. It was horrible. The weather had changed. And I see this black and orange crepe and every, everywhere, the ha- Halloween decorations. And I th- instantly thought, that, boy, it's back. Baseball's back. This is baseball. I was so disappointed that it wasn't, that there was nothing in there that was baseball that they could have bought me as a toy or as a gift, but black and orange were in my blood from age five in 1951. And I'll just finish that by saying, and we talked a little off the air, Willie is the last survivor, and he must be going on 87 years old. He's the last surviving member of that 1951 Giant team. And yeah, that and is sad and sobering at the same time. Yes, yes. Uh, again, we're talking. I'm five years old, so these guys, these guys seemed like they'd be ageless, you, you know. As um, and their pictures in my head are that of of twenty uh, five year old people, even though. F- People like Al Dark lived to be into his 80s uh, and what have you is no longer with us. I don't think of him um, as an 80-year-old man. I think of him as a 25-year-old man just as I think of myself as a 5-year-old kid. <laughs> I still I still dress as if I'm in seventh grade, but that's that's another. Story. Well, I, uh, maybe five five isn't the word, but I was so spoiled. Um, I was the first born grandchild. Um, um, all those things that go into being um, 
being partially raised by people who enjoy doing it, mm-hmm. um, and which was a contrast to, you know, being in my my, my mother's house, for instance. Uh, <laughs> just uh, so all that runs together in the in the memory thing. Um, one well, of the, you, uh, you you you, ma- you mentioned a moment ago uh, visiting relatives over in Brooklyn, uh, and you mentioned Bedford Avenue, of course, and that's where the home runs used to land if they went over the scoreboard in Ebbets right. Field. But I think one of the things that, that contributed to the incredible intimacy and interconnected relationships of the fan base of the team was really how close those boroughs were. You went across a bridge, and you were in another borough. I have, uh, for several years, I was on a uh, medical mission to Honduras. I started off just helping out, and I ended up um, translating. And one of the uh, doctors who went with us was, uh, in fact, he was one of the uh, founders of this particular mission, was a guy named Jeff Wasson who grew up in the Bronx, uh, I think in the Grand Concourse area. He used to tell wonderful stories about how all the Jewish kids would have a system of signs and whistles when the Irish kids were invading the block, you know, meant to, you know, get back upstairs or, or something like that. But Jeff was grew up as a Willie Mays fan and a Giants fan, and I never – realized, I, I, at first I was thinking, gosh, he grew up in the Bronx, you'd think he would have been a Yankee fan, but of course, the Bronx was right across the river. Uh, you could walk in five minutes from the polo grounds to the Bronx, so it was actually quite normal that you'd get a lot of uh, giant fans up there in, in that area. You, it was one subway stop, and you could literally see the opposing uh, stadium from mm-hmm. the stadium you were at. Um, yeah, when my uh, when my father and I used to go to Mets games, um, as I was growing up, I got tired of having to have part of the game blocked by adults. So I would arrange to, with my father, we would get seats in the first row of the second deck of the polo grounds. Nobody wanted them. You could get them for three and a half dollars. And from right there, which was right above the broadcast booth. You could see Yankee Stadium over the over the center field bleachers. Right, beautiful memories of that because, um, like I say, grandstand seats in those days. You were a kid, three fifty, um, whatever the amount. As a kid, you'd almost save up for it. It was um, box seats were out of the question, and um, but. In those days, for a for a five dollar bill, you could have an incredible day at, at the ballpark. Um, yes, absolutely. Scorecard was fifteen cents. They charge you maybe a nickel for a pencil, and um, you were in business. And you'd sit there and you'd study these guys and live and die with their experiences. Um, it was it was just terrific. We talked about New York being special because you almost it was almost a birthright that your team would be in the World Series. Mm-hmm. And um, like we said, from what was it, 47? You said 63. I think it was 64 even. Um, the Yankees played the Cardinals in, in 63. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Um, um, in 60. 60- 65, of course, the Dodgers are in it again, so here it was yet another team from the New York area. Exactly, and ironically, playing a team the Dodgers did um, in Minnesota, the Senators, the Nats, had moved to Minnesota, and ironically, the Giants, when they were considering moving before the Dodgers announced the Do- the Giants were on their way to Minnesota. They were going to yeah. they were going to I I've never completely 
mastered how serious that was, whether Stoneham was just sort of toying with the idea or um, whether he was really serious about it or whether it was... Oh, I think he was very serious about it. I think I remember having a Minneapolis Giants T-shirt. And I... um, (laughs) Somewhere around is a picture um, my younger brother got it passed down to him, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I still have a picture some somewhere of him wearing that Minneapolis giant. They were gone, and with um, all due respect to O'Malley, who it's hard to say because um, – we hate him universally for um, moving the Dodgers, this, that, and the other thing. They were the most um, financially successful franchise in the National League when they were in Brooklyn. I don't begrudge him being responsible for the Giants moving. They had voted to move. The only um, dissenting uh, Descending vote on the board of directors was that of Joan Payson. Mrs. Payson went on to buy the Mets um, or bring the Mets to to New York. I don't know how uh, she was awarded the the ownership of the franchise. Let's put it that way. And um, but they were gone. They um, I remember the Horace Stoneham speech. He said, I feel sorry for the kids that we're leaving behind. I was one of them. He said, but you can blame, don't blame me, blame their parents for not bringing them out to the ballpark more often. So I I know he was gone. O'Malley did a terrific thing for both franchises. I don't think that the Dodgers could have moved without the Giants moving to San Francisco and made it work because it was a long road trip for, you know, a a team going, uh, say, Milwaukee had to go out to to the West Coast, cost a lot of money. You get two teams in one. You play the, the Dodgers, come up and play the Giants, or vice versa. I don't think he could have made it work being the only team on the West Coast. Um, let, me ask, let me let me ask you something about Stoneham. The uh, O'Malley's in the Hall of Fame. Do you think Stoneham should be in the Hall of Fame? I think O'Malley should be out of the Hall, the hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> and they can meet halfway. How about <laughs> that, that? That wasn't quite my question, but I think you did answer it. I guess the answer All right. is a no. That's a, the best I can do. I, it is so, the, we just went through a Hall of Fame vote. There was a, a committee, a first-time committee of uh, named, not the Veterans Committee, but the ERA Committee or so, something like that, recently retired players. It's so subjective. The voting over the years has been tinged by so many different things. So, um, go back to Pete Rose, you can go back to Shoeless Joe Jackson, should, all, all these things. You can go back to the debate on steroids, um, should, should a Bobby Bond or Barry Bonds be in the Hall of Fame um, when he, in fact, earned the right into the Hall of Fame be, before needle ever touched buttocks. <laughs> he he was uh, had 400 stolen bases, 480 some odd home runs. He was a Hall of Famer. Um, he was playing against. He and Clemens were playing in an era where their competition was more than likely juiced as well. And um, as for the gambling, to be self righteous about gambling. Um, for baseball to be self-righteous about gambling when the owners own racetracks. And uh, casinos in the past. And, and, and Right, exactly. And um, you get a guy like Steinbrenner, for instance, um, who suspended, he has two lifetime suspensions. 
um, is is a felon. Um, you know that used to be when you were a felon, when your dad was writing crime stories, people didn't want to be be a felon. It, there was a certain disgrace to it. But Steinbrenner's a felon. They suspend him for life for contributing to Nixon's campaign, um, illegal contributions. Two years later, he's back in baseball. And, two, and five years later, he's suspended again for something else. We're talking about changing mores in the country that, and we're off the subject a little bit, but it's almost shocking to to be the age I am, and I am no saint. I'm not being holier than now. I've lived my life as a near do well hippie. Sorry, we're getting along. Selling small bags of weed <laughs> to to get by. So I'm not uh, I'm not any any better than any or worse than any anyone else. Uh, anyone else that I know personally. But you got a, uh, an administration full of um, of unindicted conspirators, um, and and a mob boss, a, a, literally a don. Um, so the the world has changed, um, and baseball, in answer to the question of who should be in the Hall of Fame, what they should do is just tear the system down and make it better. It's not, The way it is now doesn't seem to satisfy anybody, and it's become a business that had to get Baines and Lee Smith in there. Lee Smith's deserving. But the point is, the Hall of Fame was deliberately, they put people on that committee who were Chicago-based so that they could draw a contingent of people to go up and honor these guys and go up to Cooperstown and pay big bucks to get into the museum and all that goes with it. It's a business. And until you may – I don't see the Museum of Natural Art judging artifacts – to be in um, based on who's going to see them or you know what I'm saying it's just it's a museum honor people that are deserving and um, you know if you're going to exclude people for criminal past you're going to have to exclude Ty Cobb and Duke Snyder who served time in, in prison if I'm not mistaken and Willie McCovey who, ser who served time in prison for evading income tax. So, um, there you go. My, now I've ranted too much today, haven't I? Um, Snyder and McCovey, are you sure on that? Bad old, bad old Jew boy. Uh, <laughs> pardon me? I, uh, uh, Snyder and McCovey, did I hear you right? Had, um, yeah, they both uh, they both took money for card shows and what have you, and um, it didn't go over well with the authorities. They didn't report these things. Um, I know I know Willie Willie was in for a while. Um, whether or not you know he that that was righteous or not. Um, I, I think that whole era ruined the baseball card industry as we knew it. The, um, the autograph, not the baseball card industry so much as the autograph industry. Mm -hmm. You'd have guys, you'd have guys going up to these shows and people would pay good bucks to interact with them and they'd stand on line and the players, I'm, I don't know who, uh, I can't name the ones who were particularly not gracious to the fans off the top of my head. The players would look down and say, oh, Mr. Jones, uh, so great. You were so great a ball player. I saw you when you were a little kid. Uh-huh, 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 ten bucks. Here's my autograph. 
and it really yeah, I, I I used to hear some some nasty stuff about Pete Rose, for example, uh, Charlie Hustle. He basically just practically drawing a, a line on pieces of paper when people were lined up for the autograph. He he would sell game used jerseys. Um, he'd have f- sell five a day. He changed jerseys in the middle middle of a game four or five times to uh, you know to authenticate this that and the other thing. Um, I in answer to that, I would never buy. And then there's the forgeries that have come up with all, all of it. I would never buy an autograph. I wouldn't collect an autograph that I didn't see personally. Yes. <laughs> that I didn't get or, or see written. Because letters of authenticity can be forged. Sure. Sure. It's meaningless. <laughs> um, so those are just a few of the things that have ruined it. I guess I got started when they took it when the memories of the day taken away my team at, at age 11. But, you know, when I... Kick, uh, I'm when, just when, this quickly. Um, I got... I was in the Air Force stationed at Travis. Um, had to enlist because Vietnam was going on, and I ended up spending my entire adult life, practically, from 20 on, living in Northern California, and being close to where the Giants are. So um, I got to see Willie in in his second prime. Miss those mm-hmm. years um, between 57 and 65. Um, but all New York did. That was the sin. We didn't get to see Willie um, in those years. Yes, absolutely. By the way, uh, just to backtrack for a second, uh, I think what you were referring to was McCovey and Snyder both pleaded guilty for um, not reporting money from, it looks like, card shows um, to the IRS. And they actually did not, they were sentenced to uh, time or had suspended sentences. And then President Obama pardoned McCovey. I assume Snyder probably got a pardon at the same time. Uh, but oh, I just okay. want to cl- clar- clarify that. Um, never underestimate the IRS. I guess that's the moral of that, of that story. I know Al Capone would have said the same thing were he alive to say, say that. Uh, that ended up getting him uh, tax evasion. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, tax evasion and lying to the FBI, those are two bad ideas. It's usually worse than what you did to start with. You know, the cover-up is always worse. It was That's the yeah. way it was with Nixon. That's the way it is with Pete Rose. Can you imagine the, this country not forgiving him had he come clean and said, you know, I'm like anybody else. I've got demons. I've got foibles. I'm, uh, yep. I'm human. I made a mistake. And even if I yep. didn't, didn't think that, had he didn't feel that, he should have said it. Mm-hmm. And... One way or the other, and they could, and people would say, you know, the guy, what did he do? He didn't kill Christ. He, 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 I mean, it was. A, I'm leaving uh, that one alone. <laughs> but I, I am too. I'm too, trying to weigh that <laughs> and we'll we'll talk, we'll weigh the severity of the. Well, well you know, that the, um, he did say, Pete Rose said, well, didn't he say he was God? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could see him arguing that. I didn't kill him. Uh, Tony Perez killed him for crying out loud. Yeah, um, Roseboro with a bat. Yeah, <laughs> Rose, right. <laughs> Which made me really proud to be a Giant fan in 1965 on that day. Um, <laughs> that that was before 65. I don't remember. That was before I got to California, but. Um, yep. You know, you know, speaking of bats, one of the original bat days was Roy White Bat Day at Yankee Stadium. I think it was around 1966. And 
I had the pleasure of meeting Roy White and talking to him a little bit in uh, at the Yankees fantasy camp in 2015 or 16, whenever I was down in Tampa. And there are still people who come up with him with bats from that day 50 years ago. Uh, they were cheap-ass bats, and they turned yellow over the years, and there was like what looks like scotch tape on them or something, and they still come up to Roy White and say, could you sign my bats? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you must have um, been at fantasy camp with Fritz Peterson that year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was – Well, I had Fritz that's... Peterson on um, uh, on these airwaves, and – what a great guy. And I had him on with Marty Appel, who was uh-huh. the public re- relations guy and uh, a dear friend of Fritz. And they told the story of when Fritz broke the record at the right at the end, the last game or whatever, Fritz ended up having the lowest ERA of any pitcher that ever pitched in Yankee Stadium in the original yeah, right. Yankee Stadium. Yeah, and Marty and Marty talk, talked about telling him in the stadium that day when he broke the record. He was in the dugout and what have you, and uh, they relived that on on these airwaves, and that was terrific. Um, Fritz. Uh, a marvelous character, a marvelous uh, guy who's been up front with the way he, he lives his life and um, sadly is going through some tough times. Yeah, I know that, yeah. Um, yeah, um, early onset of Alzheimer's disease, which is all of our fears. I don't think there's a human being that doesn't fear that um, more than almost anything. Certainly when, when when I, when I was at the uh, fantasy camp, one of the other coaches was uh, Oscar Gamble, who has since passed away, and it was quite evident that Oscar was not feeling his best at the time. Um, but nice man, I was very sorry to see him uh, check out over the course of this past year. Yeah. Um, Man of great haircut. He and Wes Unseld yes. excelled <laughs> along those lines. Um, yeah, no, quite a hitter, Oscar Gamble. Yeah. I actually amused him a little bit because I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania when Oscar broke in with the Phillies. So I could I, – I actually remember going to see – The Phillies at Connie Mack, it must have been 1969, maybe 70, Oscar was still with the team. Uh, And he was playing, and he was sort of a um, trim, well, uh, uh, clean cut, if you can believe that, Um, Mm -hmm. young guy, uh, looked great in the uniform, looked like a great potential player. So naturally, the Phillies, being possessed with um, wonderfully foresighted management, traded him off, I think, to the Cubs or something shortly thereafter, uh, but it did amuse him. Most people remember him as uh, with the Yankees, or I think he was with the White Sox for a while. Am I correct on that? Uh, I think in, any, yes. in any case, most people remember him later in his career, and he was actually astounded maybe that somebody was still alive who remembered him from uh, playing in Philadelphia. Not that many people went to Phillies games in that era. Um, no, did, so that may you have grew up in Connecticut. Um, which team did you, um, when you went, when you lived in Philadelphia, um, did you gravitate to rooting for the Phillies? Or um, Well, um, here, here, my link to Philadelphia was twofold. I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania from 66 to 70. Um, Two of those years, Mr. Trump was there. That's a subject for another hour's conversation. Uh, But then later on, with my first wife, we moved back from – my first wife went to Penn also. So we moved back from 80 – about 87 to 93, and then I subsequently moved to California. But to answer your question, 
I didn't really attach to any of those teams, but I actually worked in media a little bit for both the Phillies and the Philadelphia Flyers. So both of those organizations were very good to me, and I kind of followed those teams a little bit as a employee, as a part-time employee might. Did you do you follow the Sixers as well? Um, I'm not that big of an NBA fan, so um, okay, not that much, not that much. No. Um, did you find yourself really getting like I did when I came to the East Bay? I really adopted the A's a little bit, and um, did you get? Be, did you have a rooting interest, or was it just about going to games? Um, uh, which sport are we talking about? Any of them? Baseball. Um, with the, with the well, um, yeah, you know, because I was doing um, some articles about Philadelphia baseball for various publications at the time, so that allowed me to have a press pass uh, on a per-game per basis. Uh, and the organization was very nice. And if I said, you know, I want to talk, can I talk to uh, Darren Dalton uh, after a game, it would get set up. There was a great uh, media guy named Larry Shank who worked for the uh, Phillies at the time uh, and some very, very nice ladies who would arrange the passes. And uh, so I, on a very superficial basis, knew several of the players and so it was hard to root against most of them when they were on the field. Uh, and certainly if they were playing any team other than, say, a New York team, uh, I was certainly for the, for the Phillies. Uh, now, I can't help you mention Trump, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I've That's never heard Trump associated with Pennsylvania. Well, Trump was at the University of Pennsylvania for two years as a student. Um, he was, I'm told he was in Wharton. Uh, I'll try to be as objective as, this, as I possibly can. Very, very few people ever saw him. Um, it's hard to find anybody. I have yet to run into anybody who says Donald Trump was a friend of mine when I was at Penn. He came in for his... Uh, uh, junior and senior year, I believe he went to Fordham for the two years before that. At a university like Penn, they, most of the friendships that you make are in your first two years because you have to take freshman classes, a freshman orientation, uh, and you're sort of you're in a freshman dorm. People who come in later often live off campus and basically don't do any of the socialization that goes on at the Penn campus. I can simply say that I was in ROTC for a couple of years, and Donald Trump, the big military hawk, I don't remember seeing him in there. Um, but, of course, he was in the middle of one of his many five uh, deferments from a friendly doctor in New York at the time. So, right. uh, of course, I wouldn't see him there. Uh, why don't you change the subject before I really get, get going? Um, oh, that, that'll make both of our blood pressures rise. I don't yeah. know if we could. The, uh, uh, I can also tell you that for somebody as wealthy as he purports to be, he's never made a significant gift to the university. And, in fact, when asked about it many years ago, you know, why don't you give money to Wharton? His response was, "Why should I finance my potential office, my present potential competition?" So, there you go. We'll let it go with that uh, today. He, he he meant Trump University as competition. Um, no, just people in people in business. Quite frankly, now now that you primed the pump here, I don't see how he could possibly have done the coursework there. Um, he's shown no concept of history, of how to construct English language sentences. Uh, he's Spelling, the president for of crying out loud. He, I, he's the only president um, I've ever seen or heard who will use myself as a noun in a phrase. Myself and some of my staff are going to be looking into this. I mean, come on, he sounds like a bouncer from uh, uh, the far reaches of Queens. Um, he's a anybody, He's a, yeah. he's a, no more than a mafia 
thug mentality that thinks mm-hmm. the law is just written for the people that aren't me. Mm-hmm. That, that's all. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's said. I want to ask you this, and then we'll get off Trump. Um, what do you think the end game is going to be? <laughs> it's hard to know. It's very hard to know. Um, for, for starters, I'm not convinced he's going to run for re-election. Uh, he could see the writing on the wall that he was going to go down to a nasty defeat, and he could just fail. He's certainly not a young man. He's uh, in what would he be now, 72, maybe something like that, 73. And I know so, that age well. Uh, yeah. we. Uh, it's just, certainly not a young man. No. So four more years after that, you, uh, I don't know. I don't think he's, he's going to be up for that. Let's face it. I don't think he's very healthy. Uh, he's way overweight. He could have a stroke. He could have a heart attack. Um, you know, I have chapped could... lips, so please don't make me laugh. <laughs> um, I'm just just saying. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. We, I, it, we it, all have uh, hopes and aspirations. The... Get up in the morning. You turn on CNN. Please, 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 <laughs> let it take care of itself. What I'm really hoping for for an end game, just to be. Uh, serious for a second. I'm hoping they get Pence along with Trump so we don't have to go through the burden of having to watch not only Pence pardon Trump, but go on to establish his sick ideology of turning back this country by 500 years, um, if possible. I think the the end the end game, frankly, that I right now am hoping for is that the new Congress can just stymie him for two years, and then the Democrats manage to defeat him or his party, and we can get on with things in 2020. I think an impeachment proceeding is going to be horrendous. I think the House could vote to impeach him, but I don't think the Senate will convict. Um, but you just don't know what uh, Mr. Mueller has up his sleeve or how far this is He's already – they already have about six different suits coming at this guy. Uh, mm-hmm. All of everything he's ever touched is is corrupt. They got him his campaign. They've got his inauguration. They've got taxes on the guy from his inheritance. Um I don't see how they can. I, I don't see how the Republican Senate can continue to ignore it, just in the best interests of the country, not to make it political anymore. I don't think when you talk politics, he's he's not um, he's not a Republican. As, no, as, no, you know, no, no ideology at all. Right. None whatsoever. And he reacts like in the meeting with Pelosi and Schumer about shutting down the government. Schumer said something to him, and all of a sudden he just says, oh, I'll shut it down. It's my game. He didn't, he didn't go in there intending to shut down the government. He just lost it. He loses mm-hmm. control, and if you come at him, he counterpunches. And um, I guess I'm most afraid at this moment, until they get him out, is somebody watching him with the button. Um, yeah, you know, I wonder about that. You know, some he can get up in the middle of the night and he can be pissed at some slight and um, and go for it. There must be some sort of fail safe. Like the, the, yeah, I, I remember there was a lot of discussion about that when Nixon was on the verge of resigning, and uh, I think it was allegedly Alexander Haig, who was, I believe, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, or still had a lot of uh, juice with the Army, had basically more or less said, uh, if he gives any weird commands, don't necessarily obey them, and... Uh, 
I don't think anything ever came to fruition. But often there's there's somebody sane looking out. But this is such a crazy, um, a, such a crazy administration, uh, unprofessional, uh, ignorant, willfully belligerent. You, you just you just keep your fingers crossed. Uh, in, in any in any case, it's sort of hard to foresee what's going to happen because you just don't know what uh, the Mueller organization is going to come up with uh, in, uh, after the first of the year. I'll tell you what right. I'd love to see. I'd, I'd love to see a couple of those Trump kids go to the slammer. Oh, would I, would I look forward to that? Uh, those kids least, that sit over endangered species that they shot, yeah. and yeah. They, they gloat. It's like a, you see people in a magazine that do, do that. These are the president's kids doing that, and he has Trump changed the rule, the idea you could bring elephant tusks back into this country now, or yeah. uh, he's, uh, I mean, just in day, why go after endangered species? Uh, I mean, what is the, what is the pathology behind that? You just, uh, how could, how could. Someone do that. And if you want to shoot them, shoot them with a camera. Get their pictures. They're beautiful when they're alive. Mm -hmm. And if you think they're beautiful when you, with you standing over them, and if you think that anybody thinks that picture is beautiful, um, you know, you, you got me as to why. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'd love to see that. I kind of like the son-in-law in a way because he um, he did something. He got this bill on prison reform through, and he had to go through his father-in-law to do that. And I think that was that could end up being a good thing um, because the, that system is screwed up. And it, so I'll, I'll cut him some slack right there. But his sons, who wake up on third base and think they hit a triple, um, yeah, you know, with, with silver spoons in their mouths, uh, horrible. Hey, uh, we're coming to an end. This has been a great show. Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure, and uh, I assume we will speak again on the Giants and other subjects in the relatively near future. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you for being a part of Comfortably Zoned. And um, if you're listening out there, it is uh, Giants baseball past, present, future. The guest is Noel Hind, and uh, as I say, fast becoming a regular, and I'm honored that you've decided to do so. Thank you again, Ralph. Take care. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for listening. If you enjoy it half as much as we do in uh, bringing it to you, everybody on this network just loves doing what they do. They do it with a passion. We all have opinions without being opinionated, and it makes for good talk radio. So uh, stay well, everybody. We'll talk to you when we do. Adios. Bye, Noel. Bye. Thank you. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.